Welcome. In this lesson, I just want to talk about Surah Al-Kahf, which is the 18th Surah and verse number 9. There's a word in this verse called wal raqim right, or al raqim which is typically translated as inscription. And this is a story about the seven sleepers. So my focus here is not to get into the story, but just focus on one word and conduct some in-depth research so as to understand what this word ar rafi means. So let's jump right in. So I want to talk about the Surah Al-Kahf, which is the 18th Surah. And while I was pondering over the Quran, because what we need to do is focus on lots of things in the Quran. So I came across verse 9, and I just thought of trying to understand this a little bit more in depth. So the verse says, I'm hasibu an nashab al-kahfi wa rakim kanu min ayatina al-jaba, which translate as, or have you thought that the companions of the cave and the inscription were among our signs a wonder? So this, this story is about the seven sleepers. If you haven't read, um, you can do so later on. And of course, their dog, right? But I'm not going to talk about the story. I'm just going to focus on my own research and understanding of what is really going on and, and what some of these words really imply or mean. So the standard translation, of course, that I read. And one of the words I want to focus on today in this lesson is the word Rakim. Um, and I'll talk about the word and what does it mean, the various meanings of this, and how does it fit into this context. For those of you who have just joined, who don't know my work, I'm an independent research scholar. I enjoy um, trying to make sense of both linguistically, technically, um, structurally, and of course uh, following the uh, pan-text analysis as well. So there's several key areas that focus on when I do my research. All right. So I'm going to focus on the word Rakim here. And the translation here is given as inscription. So have you thought about those companions of the cave? And the inscription were among our signs a wonder. So of course, uh, Allah is talking about a sign, right? So this is basically a, a wonder, so to speak, a rakim. But really, is this just an inscription? So let's dig more into this. I was fortunate enough to find um, a research conducted by Maddie, and I'll just um, highlight that. And then we'll focus on this word and see what this word really means. And then we'll go from there. So I'm going to open this PDF here that I have. This is an excellent article uh, written by an independent scholar called Mehdi Shadal. This is in the Journal of Semitic Studies and quite recent, about a couple of years or a year ago, 2017. This is when it was published. So this uh, scholar has taken this word, Rahim, and really dug into the historical analysis as well as the um, the root word analysis of this word and how does it fit into this particular verse. So, and here's a, uh, a poetry, right? Poetry in, in Persian language, which I translated, by the way, using Google, Google Translate. Um, and, and what it translates to, let me show you this, is something like, uh, here we go. So open your chin and laugh because I read from Quran the story of the companions. Okay, that's what this means. All right. And this is uh, by Nasir Khosrow in 1088 Common Era. All right, let's get into it. So one of the many Quranic terms whose meaning has long vexed the minds of traditional Muslim and students of the secular discipline of Quranic studies like is the word al rakim a hippax of legomenon that appears in the Quran in chapter 18, verse 9, which I just read. 
at the beginning of the story of the commands of the cave. So in this study, he's going to take a look at this term, which is a toponym that should be identified with Petra. Now Petra is the state capital or the capital of the ancient kingdom of Nabatea, which is south of Jordan, by the way. So if you don't know about Petra, there are other videos that I'm going to talk about and demonstrate what Petra is. Uh, this is really where uh, Al-Masjid al-Haram was and all of the other temples of the pagan temples were. But we'll get into that later. Right now I'm just going to focus on the word Al-Rakim here and based on the um, scholarly approach here. So he talks about the story of the companions of the cave referred to as the youths in the Quran, better known as the long sleepers of Ephesus. So you can take a look at that outside the Islamic tradition, um, because obviously this is more of the, the Christianity story, right? So it's not so much of the Muslim because it was it predates the Quran. So you can read the story in traditional Christian text, but the Quran mentions it. So we need to take a look at why and what and what the words are. So the Quranic version of the story is found in 926 of the 18th surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Kahf which owes its side title to the story. However, um, the author continues to say that we're here only interested in the enigmatic term that occurs right at the beginning of the narrative, which is um, That's the verse that I just read, right? Which is right here one more time. Right? Have you thought that the companions of the cave and the inscription, that's the word that we're looking at, were among the signs of God or wonder? So, the exegetical tradition presents us with five possible meanings, right? For the word al rakim So, in Arabic, the lexicon meanings or the encyclopedia meaning, the dictionary meanings of the word al rakim so here's the first meaning of the word. First, that it is a toponym, the city of the companions of the cave or the city in which whose vicinity the cave was located. So basically, the, one of the first meaning of the word is it's the name of a city, right? So al rakim is a city, and we don't know that yet, but we'll find out. The second meaning of this word has nothing to do with the companions of the cave, rather Ashab al-Rakim were another group of people with a different saga, totally unrelated to the Ashab al-Kaha. So this is again another meaning that is given, that it's nothing to do with the Ashab al-Kaha, but it's actually Ashab al-Rakim, different group of people. The third meaning, or associated meaning to al-Rakim, was the name of the cave or the mountain in which the youths took refuge. So the third meaning is the actual cave or the mountain's name, right? So once again, the first meaning was the city. Second meaning was it's not the Ashab al-Kahaf, it's Ashab al -Rukhi. The third meaning is that it's the name of the cave or the mountain, right? Where they actually took refuge. And fourth meaning is that al rakim refers to the inscription in which the names of these youths were recorded. So now we have a tablet or inscription, right? Right in front of the cave where the names of all of these youths were recorded or inscribed. So this translation inscription is actually being used by our normal traditional translation of the Quran, right? So when you say al rakim you mean the inscription, right? And by this we mean the wonder of God or Allah, right? And or the signs of wonder. So have you thought about the companions of the cave and the inscription, right? This is one of the fourth meaning that we just saw. All right. And then we have the fifth meaning, right? So I'm going to go down here. And the fifth, according to the fifth interpretation, al rakim was the name of their dog. Okay, so there are five historical or traditional or Arabic, right, related meanings of the word al-Rakim. So 
Let me backtrack quickly. First meaning was the city. Second meaning that they're not Ashab al-Kahaf, they're someone else. Third is the actual mountain or the name of the cave. Fourth is the inscription which records the name of these youths. And fifth is the name of the dog, right? So let's explore more one by one. And then finally, we'll take a look at how this author wonderfully concludes, and that makes sense, of the actual meaning of the word al-Rahim. So here's the first interpretation, right? Which is to be dismissed right off the bat, um, because, which is the last one, right? The name of the dog. For the Textus Receptus records and verse that Anna Ashaba la Kahaf wal Rahimi, assuming that this has preserved faithfully in this place, we can see that al Rahimi is a Majrur, right? In Arabic, it's a genitive sense. And that's, of course, those of you who know grammar would understand what a Majrur is. And thus, could not be a dog's name. Okay? So, if you were to have a dog's name, then the verse would read companions of the cave and of the dog. Okay? So that we can rule out completely. So out of those five, the fifth one is down. And then we move to the other possibility, which is with respect to the suggestion that Rakim must signify writing or inscription, right? And this is again the standard translation that has been used by the traditional approach interpreting the Quran or translating the actual word al-Rakim, which is inscription. So, it may signify writing or inscription, an unsuperable objection that might be raised is that this usage is virtually unattested in Arabic, despite the fact that roots derivatives are quietly, quite commonly encountered. What is more, one may wonder why the Quran should use such morphologically strange form of tri-literal radical, which is ra -qa -qa, right? Whilst every elsewhere it uses the expected maf'ul right, form to designate something written or inscribed. So, of course, this is like doing something, right? Like a verb. So, maf'ul in Arabic, is, is to designate something written or inscribed, which is, again, if you were to look at Surah 83 or Chapter 83, Verse 9, which speaks of a written book, like Kitab al okay? What well, that means, that's a written book. But here, al rahim it doesn't make sense that it's a written, or it, it implies or, or is translated as being a written book. Uh, inscription okay so one of the other authors like Sidney Griffith has tried to explain away the problem by suggesting that it might be a uh, Syriac right text like the scenario where for instance would be that the form of the passive participle feel used as substantive adjective file but Griffith's um, argument is just going in circles, right? So I'm going to scroll down here, and you can read about the Griffith's uh, argument itself. It just goes back and forth. It doesn't really conclude on anything. So we're thus left with two possibilities, that Al-Rakim is the name of the mountain, cave, or is the name of the town. In any case, a toponym, right? So we ruled out the inscription part. Let's go back to the inscription because that's important because that's what we typically use, right? So, let me go through this uh, so that we understand why is it not inscription. So, let's go back to our Sidney Griffith here and who's trying to explain. And this could be a Syriac passive participle feel used as a substantive adjective file has been imported into Arabic dictation or diction to produce the anomalous al rakim presumably originally by an Arab-speaking Christian with a Syriac-speaking background. But Griffith's translator must have been an eccentric person to have failed in producing an idiomatic rendering at only one place in a rather lengthy and arguably lucid text. 
Griffith's argument is, in the main, based upon the reference to the inscription in Jacobs of Sarugs, which is 521 common era, homily on the sleepers of Ephesus. This, however, hardly constitutes new evidence in favor of the claim. One does well to remember that the Muslim commentators who took the term to mean inscription had doubtlessly been themselves influenced by the reference to it in the Christian versions of the legend, right? So once again, seems like a, a Christian story, right, of seven sleepers, which is prior to the Quran, right, has already been there since ages. And it seems like when you translated the word al Rakim or the, the traditional translators, they translated al Rakim as uh, inscription and just took the meaning, one of the meanings that was already from that Christian story. Or rather a legend, right? It's not even a story. It's, it's Christian versions of the legend. So Griffith further contends that al Rakim could just possibly mean inscription or tablet citing Lane's Arabic-English lexicon as a source. So, of course, one of the meanings of the word Rakim is inscription, right, or writing. And if you look at the uh, lexicons like Lane's or Lisan al Arabiya, right, Arabic-English lexicon, you would find the same. And again, it must be remembered that Lane is himself reliant on the tradition for the meaning of the term. And that's, that's important, right? So think about it. So Lane, while translating in the lexicon, is also thinking about or, or importing that meaning from the early, early Christian legend, right? For the story. Not only that, moreover, the fact that the term is not attested with any other meaning may simply be an indication that it is a toponym, as pointed out above. So Griffith's arguments are thus entirely circular and reveal nothing new, and generally the affin affinities he adduces between the Syriac and Quranic versions are so general and so common to most versions of the legend that they fail to convince one of the existence of a Syriac background, as he claims, to the Quranic narrative. So the tablet interpretation doesn't seem to be anything more than ingenious conjecture on the part of the exegetes and hardly reflects their knowledge as to the true signification of the word. So we're thus left with two possibilities. al Rakim is either a name of mountain or cave, or that it is a name of a town. In any case, both are toponyms. Okay? All right. So out of the five, we're left with two. Now it's either a mountain or cave, or it's a city. Let's move forward. So, I want to go down to here, the RQM, okay? So, really, the, the RQM is the Semitic name of the city of Petra. In 1965, for instance, the French archaeologist, Jean Starkey, hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, published a report about an important find an otherwise mundane funerary inscription mentioning a place called RQNW, which was to be identified as the Semitic name of Petra. So the basis of this identification was a reference to a town as RQM in the Targumim and other rabbinic writings, and the Rukim or Arakim and Arakim and Josephus and Subius. So the first century epitaph uh, discovered at the entrance of the sea leading to the archaeological sites of Petra, nearly modern day Wadi Musa, reads as follows. So now we have some evidence, right? So here's evidence that says that, you know, they found something and that has some writing on it, and this is the writing. So this is the monuments of the PTRYS and the son of TRPTS and so forth, right? Who was in RQMW, who died and so on. So this is in the first century. Moving forward, the same archaeologist renders the last line of this, right, which is in French, and is followed by this later commentators. So, 
The author of this particular article, therefore, opted to amend the text to read, Who was the servant of God of TYMW, right? And it continues on. Let's go to the second um, evidence that they provide. The Semitic name of Petra in the form of RQM also shows up in the Syriac document, right? So not only in the first century, right, that was discovered, but also it shows up in the Syriac document brought to light in the first time in 1977 by Sebastian Brock. So in this document, a letter attributed to Cyril of Jerusalem, which is 387 common rare, on the attempt to rebuild Jerusalem temple during the reign of Julian the Apostate. We read of the destruction wrecked by the earthquakes of 363 CE. So, of course, they find some documents in the document. They say there were some earthquakes happening in 363 CE, in which many cities of Palestine and Provincial Arabia were partially and totally destroyed, including more than half of RQM. Okay? And, of course, this can be readily identified or Brock readily identifies RQM Petra in his translation. So there's the second evidence, right? The name RQM is actually tested in another Syriac test. This is moving on to the third. That has been known since the early 20th century, but has gone unnoticed since its first commentator, Francois Now. Okay? So we have another, you know, piece of evidence that really no one really noticed. So this text in the Syriac Vita Burswama in 456 CE, a work of hagiographical nature, right? So it's not archaeological, but hagiographical nature, narrating the miraculous life of its eponymous character. According to uh, the Vita, in this itinerary through Palestine, Phoenicia, and Arabia, Burswama happened upon an idol or, or a group of idol worshippers, right? who shunned him, refusing to allow him in a great city of theirs called RQMDGY. So RQMDGY seems to be the full name of Petra to distinguish it from RQM, RQMDHGRH. Both of these RQMs are known from the rabbinic sources. So, and these sources, especially in the um, Targumim, for, for example, as well as the Syriac, equate RQM with biblical Cadiz or RQM, HGRH, so on. So again, this is the third time it's actually showing up. All right. And also, let me scroll down here a little bit. Mention should also be made of the homily attributed to Subius of Caesarea, 340 CE, preserved only in the Syriac translation, wherein Petra is glossed with the statement the city called RQM in the tongue of people of Mesopotamia, right? This is again Iraq, modern Iraq. The old name is Mesopotamia. So those individuals were also related to this as RQM. So again, this is just uh, the name in the uh, Gentilic form RQM. Why also appears in another well-known text, the Book of the Laws of Countries by Bardesian of Edisa, 222 CE, which holds the distinction of being the oldest extant Syrian composition, right? Here the law of the RQM and the land of the people of RQM are mentioned together with those of the Edessians and the Arabs. All right, so this is about the actual RQM uh, history and the mention of this city in several uh, various texts. Let's come to the Greek sources because in this account, the war between the Israelites, the Moses Israelites and the Midianites and the Antiquites, right? These are the um, Judeci of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, contrived a popular etymology for the Semitic name of Petra. According to Josephus, all of the five kings of the Medianites perished in the battle, including their fifth, Rechimos, or the Rokomon, or the Rokom, in the uh, Septuagint, Rechem, and the Hebrew Bible. So he, uh, this historian also, mentions this. By Arabia, no doubt, Josephus means Nabatea, because really uh, they were Nabatean uh, or Arabians belonging to Nabatea. 
which is modern day Petra, which later became the Roman province of Arabia. And he observes elsewhere that the 12 sons of Ismail or Ishmael occupied the whole country extending from the Euphrates to the Red Sea and called it Nabataean. And it is these who conferred their names on the Arabian nation and the tribes in honor both of their own prowess and in the name of Abraham. So keep in mind that Abraham had two sons, right? Uh, Ishaq and then Ismail in Arabic. So the last prophet uh, is from the reign of Ismail, right? Whereas uh, the Israelites or the Jews, um, Jewish people are from the reign of Ishaq, right? Or, all right. So, so this Jewish historian thus equates Arabia with Nabataea. Okay. So this is the Greek sources. Let's take a look at the Arabic sources. The geographical uh, compendium of Sihab al-Din Abu Abdullah Yaqut uh, Hijri or 1229 common era. Uh, in his collection, the Mujam al-Buldan, if you need to take a look at that, you can somewhere here. The Mujam al-Buldan, you can go buy this book and take a look at that as well. There's a catalog record. You can find this online as well and kind of read through it uh, if you choose to do so. So in this collection, which is probably the most important and most famous medieval gazetteer compiled in Arabic. Okay. So in this entry, in his entry rather, on al raqim Yakut states that in the vicinity of al balka in the environs of Al-Sam, there is a place called al raqim which some of them, or its inhabitants, believe to be the resting place of the people of the cave, right? The seven sleepers. So that is also recorded within the Arabic sources as the name of a city or a place. So it's evident from Yakut's wordings that he knew the place from outside the legendary tales right surrounding the Quranic narrative. There exists a place called Al-Rakim, he averts. So the fact that some people unsurprisingly connected it to the story of companions of the cave has no bearing on the reality of the town's existence. So... Basically, we just looked at the meaning of the word, al-Rakim, and we said, hey, it's an inscription, okay? Which, again, borrowed from the Christian legendary story, and there we go. So we just translated it that way. But really, is this a sign or a wonder, right, from the one and only God? All right, so Yakut also recognizes that this is a town, right? And he has no hesitation in giving us his opinion concerning the location of the companion city, but the truth is that their resting place lies in Byzantine territory, as will be mentioned. So, Yakut also adds that Yazid bin Abdul Malik, right, who ruled between 720 or somewhere between 720 to 724 Kamanura, used to dwell in al rakim right? used to go to al rakim which is the city, and rest, and so forth. And once again, um, the 720 means it's about 100 years um, approximately after the death of the last prophet. So in the respect of al-Balqa, Yakut says that it is a district of Damascus between al-Sam and Wadi al-Qura. Its metropolis being Amman, which is presently in Jordan. Okay. According to another author, Sams al-Din al-Abu, al Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmad al-Maqdisi, right, which is about 990 CE, al-Rakim is a town at a distance of one Farsa from Amman, Jordan, on the fringes of the desert. Right? So al-Maqdisi appends also uh, his entry, a popular legend about a cave near this Rakim, in which three graves could be found. So the last geographical source in the Taqwim al-Buldan by Abu Fida Ismail in 1331 CE, who's evidently reliant on Abu Ishaq Ibrahim Muhammad al ishtari 4th century, for the first part of his entry. And he reports that al-Rakim is one of the most 
famous places of Al-Sam being a small town near Al-Balka. Its houses are entirely carved out of stone, if it were a single piece of rock. Al-Balka is one of the districts of Al-Sarat, one day's journey from Jericho, and Jericho is to Al-Balka's west. Perfect. All right. So during this Salahuddin Nayyab, you be moving forward, right? This is the fourth, third or fourth, rather. So Salahuddin Ayyubi and Nurul Zangi, um, their expedition against the Crusaders, stronghold of Al Karak, in about 1172 Common Era, or 568 Hajrud. The latter is said to have departed from Damascus and encamped in Al Rakim. So basically, Nurul Zangi, right, camped in Al Rakim. According to Abu Fida, Al Rakim is near Al Karak, contemporary event. Abu Hassan Ali ibn al Tayyib, 1233 CE, glosses Al Rakim with the statement between it and Al Karak is two days' journey in his account of the event. Okay, So there are various historical documents and uh, recordings that are being cited by this author so as to identify Al Rakim as being a name of a city. Okay, So that's all the research that he's doing. All right. I'm going to go down to Finally, the conclusion of it. A um, couple other things that you can quickly glance um, is that it may be seen that the Rakim of the uh, writers being in the vicinity of Amman could not be identified with Petra, which is over 200 kilometers distance from the Jordanian capital. But what about the other RQM and the RQM of HGRH? Could this Rakim be the same place as RQM DHGRH? While this evidence is less than decisive, one can make sense of such an identification. All right. All right. So we get the idea, right? So all of this is pointing to um, Al-Rakim being the name, name of a city. So we're now going to turn to the last piece of evidence from the medieval Arab Islamic tradition for the location of Al-Rakim. Um, in a brief report in Al-Tabari's Tafsir, right? So Tabari is an historian, Arab historian. In his tafsir on the authority of Ibn Abbas, according to this tradition, Al-Rakim is a wadi, is a valley, right, between Usfan and Ayla, on the southern extremity of Palestine. Located near Ayla, Al-Rakim Wadin Baina, Usfan wa Ayla, right, and so forth. So, but Petra is to the northeast of Isla, modern Akaba, is not between the Isla and Spot. The solution to this riddle must be sought in a variant of this tradition found in Abu Bakr, Muhammad ibn Musa al Damiris, according to which Al Rakim is a valley or wadi between Amman and Isla on the south extremity of Palestine. And this latter version lacks the final part of Al-Tabari's report, which places Al-Rakim closer to Isla, right? So we're, we have identified that it's a city, but it's just a matter of placing where exactly the city is, right? Perfect. Let's go down. So the other two pieces of information supplied by this tradition tally with what we already know of Petra equally well. It is a wadi, and most significantly, it marks the southern boundary of Palestine according to the rabbinic list of border towns of the Holy Land. We may therefore rest assured that Al-Tabari's Rakim is indeed Petra, thus adding another witness to our repertoire. What remains to be explicated is the superfluous Ya in Rakim. Okay? Given that no variant reading for this word has been recorded, one might safely assume that the Muslim tradition has faithfully preserved the orthography of the term and that to judge by the Semitic form RQM. There existed an uncertainty as to its spelling. This ambiguity in the orthography shows that the town's name was almost certainly pronounced Rafimu in Nabataean Aramaic, since could be represented both with or without the matter lectionis in Aramaic. All right, let's take a look at rival traditions before we end. But where was Quranic Rakim Petra village near Amman? In 1732, Albert Schultz produced an edition and Latin translation 
of Ibn Saddad's Al Nawadir, right? Then Ayubi, which report which appended relevant excerpts from other sources, including the passage from Abu Fida, right? In this book, the geographical indexes, Shalton suggested that Wakim was the same place as Petra. Later in the 19th century, Edward Robinson argued against this identification, pointing out, among other things, that Abu Fidar Wakim lay to the north of Al Karak, far from the location of Wadi Musa. So, once again, the argument now is not whether it's a city or not, the argument is uh, where is this city, right? That's it. So, the 19th century Oriental studies thenceforth sided with Robinson in locating this Rakim around Amman, even took a further step in equating it with the Quranic Rakim. Scholarship has since veered away from these consequences, presumably because from the point of view of most scholars, a small village near Rahman is unlikely to have any special significance for the people living there, right? or for the inhabitants for the central Hejaz in late antiquity which is currently Hejaz is Saudi Arabia. However, the same could be said of Petra. All right. So we know this, right? On the other hand, the context of the Quran's uh, presentation of its own true version of the tales show that the competing versions of it were in circulation at the time. And it's evident from verse 22 of the surah because the if you read the context of uh, the surah itself, let me go up here. Let me scroll down to 22, where they actually talk about there's an argument going on how many people were there, right? Because they weren't sure whether they were, you know, uh, someone said there were uh, two or uh, where's 22? There we go. So they will say there were three, the fourth of them being their dog, and they will say there were five, the sixth of um, them being their dog, guessing at the unseen. And they will say there were seven, and the eighth of them was their dog. So say, O Muhammad, my Lord is most knowing of their number. No one knows them except a few. So do not argue about them except with an obvious argument and do not inquire about them among the speculators from anyone. So clearly there's an argument going on after the fact, right? After the seven sleepers were being identified and years have passed and people are arguing, well, how many were they, right? So that's exactly what is happening here because the Quran presentation of its own true version of the tale shows the competing versions were in circulation at that time, as evidence, evident from the verse 22. So the sectarian background to this rival traditions may be surmised from um, version, uh, verse 4 to 5, so as to warn those who say God has adopted uh, a son, right, in this sectarian milieu, it seems the Quran has opted for an Arabic version of the story, a version adorned with trappings of orthodoxy. And this Arabian version had a champion in Arabic city, Arabian city rather, as the abode of his heroes and Petra, founded by the sons of Ismail. Was the Arabian city par excellence? So, based on this author's research and uh, the evidentiary value of what al rakim is, right? Let me scroll up all the way. Um, it seems pretty uh, evident, right, that this word in the above verse here, verse 9, right? 18 verse 9. So, or you have thought about the companions of the cave and the city, right? al rakim were among the signs of wonder, right? Which is by the way, al rakim is another name for the word Petra, okay? And that's what we're talking about here. So I hope this helps. Um, just wanted to do my, get my two cents of the research regarding um, uh, doing some uh, pondering and, and, and focusing on, on some of these words on the verses. As uh, Allah says, Tatar al Quran, right? So we need to really focus on all of these areas and issues in, in the, the Quran as we move forward. And despite the fact that we have a common translation of inscription um, borrowed from the legend, and with one of the meanings as well, right? But the evidence itself, as per research that I just demonstrated and read, 
by Mahdi Shadel, who's an independent scholar, um, sounds more plausible. But again, if you have questions, just post your questions in the discussion area. Um, it's always nice to have a candid discussion, uh, questions and answers. I love doing research, so I'll be more than happy to move this forward. If you have any questions or need to ask something, post uh, down below. I'm going to leave the link for this as well. If you need this document, uh, let me know. I will um, send you this particular PDF that I've downloaded. So you can also read and take a look and ponder yourself. All right. So I hope this helps. Um, I will speak to you guys later.